I'm Debbie Holly. I'm the Professor of Learning Innovation here in the Faculty of Health and Social Sciences. I've just finished some work with the EU looking at their digital competency framework for health and safety and well-being. And some of these, those kinds of experiences obviously illuminate some of the work that we'll be talking about over the next three sessions. And my research interests are in innovation and simulation, and especially thinking about how we can enhance the student experience with digital technologies. So joining me today is Anthony, Dr. Anthony Basil, I should say. He's our researcher who's working with us on our Health Education English projects, and he's had a lead on innovation and innovation technology as part of his role with us. Um, in his previous life, he's led numerous institutional-wide tell innovations and implementations, so we're very fortunate to have him working with us. So, with, well, without further ado, um, I shall welcome, Anton, welcome David, and then we'll just go through some housekeeping slides and, and then we'll be off. Um, David was the founding director of the Serious Games Institute at Coventry University. He succeeded in establishing this centre as an, an international centre of excellence for serious games and immersive technology research and really significantly linked to regional development. So he designed the research infrastructure, the development strategy, and they had business incubation, academic research and innovation showcasing in the same building. And that model has now been copied in West Virginia, Singapore and South Africa. He's committed to educational innovation, as can be evidenced by his extensive leadership and presence in Second Life, among other, other locations. And he's an expert advisor, re reviewer, rapporteur, and a business mentor for the EU Horizon 2020 technology calls. He's much in demand as a keynote speaker, and we're thrilled that we've managed to get him for three, three webinars with us. So, highly delighted to welcome David. So, if you'll just give me one second, a warm welcome. Just a little talk about how David will be sharing his views on disruptive technologies and how they're likely to affect the nursing profession. He'll be sharing examples from his collection, and after which we'll invite audience questions. So as we're going, please pop all your questions into chat, and then we'll have a whole lot of questions in chat, and then we can we can we can do that. So I think David's aiming to speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and so there'll be plenty of time for discussion. Um, housekeeping, we're recording. If you don't want recorded, if you amend your name on the screen and keep the video off, um, questions into chat. And if anybody is a, a Twitter person, our Nurses Research Centre is at Nurses for Long Term Health. We'd really welcome um, any tweets. So enjoy. And then there's a little link there to the next event, which is on the 15th of June, where we'll be talking about the metaverse health and well-being. And there's our links just in case you want to take a quick photograph to get in touch afterwards. So I think that is just about it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and come back to the Zoom meeting here. And I just need to accept that. And I come down here now and Brilliant. I am just going to swap cameras over it so it's a little bit more like I'm going to be interviewing David. So, David, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. So, uh, what are we going to be doing? Well, Debbie, thank you very much for your... I, I'm, I'm blushing already with your uh, very kind words. Um, <laughs> I, if I just to, to spare myself embarrassment and to get straight on with the presentation, I'm going to stop my video uh, and I'm going to go into my presentation. And one of the innovations that uh, we, in a way, we're testing out today is the use of a virtual reality environment, a uh, virtual television studio uh, that I'm going to be doing my presentation from. So as soon as I start sharing my screen, you'll see me in the, this virtual television studio and I'll go straight into my presentation. So I'm going to stop my video now.
Okay, you should now be able to uh, to see oh, me. Oh, can we in... can? It looks fabulous. Yeah. I'm I... going to meet myself as well now. Okay, okay. Well, I should say uh, right at the very beginning that um, uh, this is not a real photograph of me. Um, it's a, it's a, an avatar generated by artificial intelligence. Um, and in the studio, I'm just going to give you just a few views of the TV studio that I will be likely to toggle through uh, doing my, my, my presentation. Um, yes, so this isn't, this isn't, this isn't really me. It is me, but it's a, a, an AI generated avatar. And I'd like to show you just a few more of these uh, as, as my introduction. So I'm going to begin by talking about some cool things you can do with AI and VR that are relevant to nursing education. Uh, and I want to make the point that, you know, this is all very hot topic uh, and it seems very new, but actually it's the ideas behind all of this have been around for a long time, going back to my early days at the Serious Games Institute, so 15 years ago. I'm going to give some good news uh, and there I'm going to reveal some avatar pictures of uh, Debbie and Anthony. Uh, and then I'm going to start by asking what chat GPT thinks about the future of AI. Um, I thought if I'm going to talk about chat GP, GPT, at least I should give it an opportunity to give its views on the future of nursing education. I'm going to show you some examples of AI and VI in nursing. I'm going to talk about the COVID effect because this is re re relevant to the acceleration in the use of digital technologies in all aspects of our lives. And uh, to go on to a couple of other relevant things which are related to what's likely to happen with the future of uh, nursing and one of them is the aging society challenge and the second is the, the uh, focus on preventative health care and digital therapeutics. Uh, my summary conclusions won't take very long uh, and then we'll be uh, able to open up into uh, to questions. So here are some of my other alter egos um, all of these avatars were generated. I've actually got a hundred of them, but I've picked um, a number of them. So you can see uh, that there are likenesses from these AI generated avatars. In fact, I'm quite tempted to um, not show my real video on some of these uh, presentations that I do and use my, my avatar uh, instead. I want to now just give you another quick example um, of how within my business um, I use combined artificial intelligence and um, virtual reality uh, to show some examples of the kind of that I work that I do. So what you see on the right of the screen there is actually an artificial human. Um, this is an artificial human um, and what I've done is I've programmed him with some audio that I recorded uh, to talk about the kind of work that we do um, at 360 and 360 immersive experiences. So you'll see a number of examples of um, 360 degree virtual environments uh, that reflect the kind of things that uh, we do um, in, in, in the business. So I'm going to stop playing the video now. How would you like to fly over the city of Kuala Lumpur at night? So th this is actually a real photograph of Kuala Lumpur at night with a drone. Museums in Milton this again is a 360 degree photograph like of a museum, a recording of a family event uh, with my Imagine partner's father who has now passed away. Of the most famous steam I love steam locomotives um, and I've got quite a few immersive experiences on the footplate of uh, steam locomotives. I use 360-degree uh, photographs also to capture living memories. Another drone video of my hometown, uh, Boston in Lincolnshire with a Boston stump. They can be shared on kinds of, all kinds of environment. Take a look at some of the examples on this page. So this is what I have on my, my, my opening page. So I'm now going to go on to the next. And th this is going back in time. Um, right at the beginning of when I started as the founding director of the Serious Games Institute um, and I think you'll be quite impressed by uh, what was developed by a local games company. This is a games company called Blitz Games. 
they set up a serious games arm uh, and they wanted to show how you could use games technologies and 3D scanning uh, to create avatars, lifelike avatars, that can simulate medical uh, conditions um, and, and also be used in training of people like paramedics. So I'm going to play the video now. So this begins with a 3D scan um, and they use a 3D scan to create some algorithms that actually manipulate the facial expressions of this avatar. So by using a variety of slider bars, uh, they can create all kinds of um, emotions. Um, and so you can imagine how these can be used within video games, but they can also be used in all kinds of different simulations. And what I'm going to go on to now is to a simulation that links medical data to show nurses and medical practitioners what it, the experience of watching someone die from a head wound. So on the left hand side you see uh, the, the avatar in his normal condition and on the right hand side you see someone who is going to die in the next 30 seconds. And what you will see is how the medical data is being used to simulate the blood flow, it's going to simulate the, the pulsing of the veins in the neck as the body tries to um, uh, cope with a situation. You'll see the avatar change in colour and become pale. You'll see the avatar sweating. Uh, you can see the veins pulsing now. Um, and within 30 seconds, uh, you'll see what it's like to, to watch somebody die from a head wound. Uh, He's now reaching the end. And all of this goes back to around 2007 and 2008. So that's one example of a video. Um, but I also want to show you an example of uh, other practical uses of this same technology. And in, in the top left hand corner of the screen, you can see um, uh, a scene from uh, a product called Triage Trainer. And the idea is that people uh, are unlikely, hopefully, ever to have experienced triaging people who are victims of a, uh, an explosion in a city centre. So the city centre you see there is based on Leamington Spa, and you'll see the explosions. And they, they use this to set up a series of avatars who need to be triaged. So this was actually a game as part of a research project to establish whether you could use virtual reality um, and simulations like these uh, to replace some of the traditional methods of nursing training or paramedic training uh, using typically uh, mannequins. Uh, so the idea is that the, the, um, uh, the players in this game uh, go around the city centre triaging four or five patients and they're measured on the accuracy of their triaging and the time it takes us to, to do that. And the results of this research project indicated that these types of simulations are more effective than traditional methods. And the reason is that people find them more realistic and so they're more engaged in them. Uh, this is an example of virtual hospital ward, going back to those early days, a little bit primitive. And then at the bottom of the screen, uh, this is another project called Patient Rescue. Uh, and you'll see three avatars at the bottom. The idea is that you could automatically generate an avatar with different ages, ethnicities, backgrounds, and medical conditions. And you could use these avatars uh, to simulate medical conditions uh, to train uh, new doctors coming into the profession. Because when they first start, they won't have dealt with um, uh, lots of conditions and you're able to show them things that they may not uh, it may may even not ever come across in their lifetime but so this is not new this is a point that I'm trying to make is is not new but the good news is that <laughs> AI and VR are likely to benefit the nursing profession substantially and I've taken the liberty of um, repurposing pictures of um, Dr Holly and Dr Basil uh, Dr. Holly has got a nurse's uniform on and a seaside background. 
um, and Dr. Basil. Uh, I wanted him to be in a white doctor's outfit, but that was beyond uh, AI. Uh, so he's, he has got a hospital background. And the picture on the right is not an actual photograph. It was generated by uh, artificial intelligence. So there's some good news, and, and I want to explain why um, AI and VR are likely to benefit the nursing profession substantially. And one of the reasons is, and it's something that um, really inspired me from a, uh, an online conference I did some time ago, um, and it was a, a lady presented uh, a project called No One Dies Alone. And essentially, it showed um, the, the value of the nursing profession and the human values of nursing that are very unlikely to be replaced by AI. Uh, nursing is a vocation which is based on human values like em empathy and intuition and all of these things are unlikely to be replaced by AI, at least not in the near term. So what does ChatGPT say on AI and nursing education? And I asked ChatGPT to give me 10 quotes and academic paper references on the impact of AI and nursing education. So the first one says it's got the potential to revolutionize nursing education by providing personalized learning experience and real-time feedback. I agree with that entirely. AI-powered virtual tutors, 24 by seven, support to nursing students, allow them to study and practice at their own pace. And the use of AI in nursing education can increase students' engagement and motivation, in leading to improved learning outcomes. So I agree with all of those. What does it have to say on nursing roles? Again, I ask Chuck GP the question. It's got the potential to augment the clinical decision-making and diagnostic skills of nurses, leading to improving patient outcomes. It can help reduce the workload and burnout of nurses and allow them to focus on high level tasks. And it can provide real time access to patient data, allowing them to make more informed decisions and provide better care. Again, I don't have any issues with any of those. What about nursing education with VR? VR can provide nursing students with immersive hands-on learning experiences that simulate real-world patient scenarios. And these may be scenarios they, they're unlikely to hopefully encounter in real life. It can also help students develop clinical reasoning and critical thinking skills in a safe and controlled environment. And, can, and it can provide students with interactive and engaging learning experience that are less stressful and more enjoyable than traditional methods. So I happen to agree with the uh, chat GDP on those. I didn't actually check the validity of the academic references, but um, I can leave somebody else to do that if they watch a recording of this presentation. So <clears throat> AI and VR are in nursing, and I already mentioned that AI um, has the potential, maybe that not everybody knows about, to be able to create um, artificial images and videos. Uh, so in this case, I used an application um, to, and I told it that what I wanted, I wanted a nurse, what nurse using a smartphone in a hospital environment, and I wanted it to show me, make me a picture of a nurse using VR and some haptic tele technologies in training. So, what about the impact of AI and VR on nursing uh, responsibilities? Well, I think this is one of the really big changes that we can expect over the coming years is that it's likely to have a major impact on changing nurses' uh, responsibilities and practices because with the assistance of AI and, and VR, nurses will be able to take on tasks that have been traditionally done by specialists. And an example of this um, is perhaps to is a radiologist. Now, a, a radiologist traditionally has one of the major tasks is to be able to not only scan patients, whether x-rays or MRI scan, but also to interpret the data and, and recognize whether some medical intervention is involved. Well, we've already reached the point where uh, AI has got the ability to actually provide more accurate diagnoses than um, human beings. 
So in that instance, and in many others in medical practices, particularly where uh, AI and big data is being used to do for, for medical diagnostics, it creates opportunities for nurses to take on high level uh, skills. Um, it, it also empowers nurses, and I, I'm not that I don't have a thing about doctors, but if you look at the doctor's medical bag, it hasn't changed in, in not only in decades, in centuries. So doctors and their medical bags still have stethoscopes and a range of, of um, blood pressure devices, which are you know, uh, age old. And we're reaching the point now, particularly with some of the wearable technologies and devices that are being consumerized, um, that uh, nurses will be able to support many of these things by uh, using the data that is collected uh, from these types of devices. And I think there's going to be uh, a shift uh, in the way in which we, uh, we handle the long-term uh, care of patients particularly. I want to show you another example. Um, and this, uh, this shows a transition from in, in a surgical environment from um, you know, maybe a traditional uh, surgical uh, ward um, to the latest robotic surgery. But in between, uh, the example I've shown is actually my partner. Uh, my partner, Jackie, um, she actually has no medical training. Uh, she has very little interest in computers and absolutely no interest in simulation and games. But she came with me on a trip to Kuala Lumpur on one occasion, which was to do with a medical technology conference. And <coughs> pardon me, one of the booths there uh, was actually a tool to train surgeons on laparoscopic surgery. So what Jackie is looking at on the screen um, is uh, laparoscopic surgical tools. And this is a, the task is to remove a gallstone. Um, using the laparoscopic tools with hap haptic feedback. Um, and she was able to remove a gallstone and get a be better results than many trainee surgeons uh, through the use of these kinds of technologies. So technology is very empowering, but it's also very challenging to establish practices. Uh, virtual reality. I know Bournemouth University are doing some fabulous things with, uh, with virtual reality um, and devices like the, the HoloLens and um, augmented reality uh, headsets. And this is just an example of um, how a nurse can be uh, trained with something uh, like a HoloLens that will enable her to find her way around the human body. Um, and learn about it in, in her own time and her own pace. So, but it's not just a case of artificial intelligence and virtual reality. Um, all of these things are made possible, and this is why it's taken so long to, for AI and virtual reality to become uh, more mainstream, um, is that it requires a cocktail of technologies, uh, which include AI and machine learning, Wearable devices and the Internet of Things are biometric devices which are increasingly consumerized. I wear two smartwatches, uh, one from China and one, uh, one Fitbit device, um, just to check it again. So I, 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 I've been doing this for nine years now and um, it helps me to better manage my own health. But it also requires fast network connections, 5G and broadband. Um, because it's becoming uh, consumerized, we see all of these things appearing on smartphones and mobile applications. So that's a very important uh, development for the future of healthcare. Um, virtual reality and simulation I've mentioned, and the Internet of Things, which is how all of these different types of devices um, are connected to cloud computing that makes uh, artificial intelligence and the interpretation of big data possible. So coronavirus has really accelerated the digital revolution. Um, and one of the things that it's had um, is had an impact on patient care because of restrictions in physical contact, uh, not only between patients, but also between uh, physicians and patients. And so this has led to a, a demand for telemedicine and remote care. 
and it's accelerated the use of consumable wearables which are medical grade in order to monitor patients remotely in their own homes. But it also allows us to explore personalised healthcare using a combination of artificial intelligence and epigenetics. Everybody has different DNA and everybody has different propensities for different kinds of medical conditions. But it's also had a, led to a shift from cure to, from cure to prevention um, and it's accelerated the demand for integrated care services. So this is one of the implications for the future of nursing is that a lot of um, patient care will be done remotely. So future care I think is more likely to be based um, in local communities using integrated care services uh, with a shift away from hospitalisation wherever it can be avoided. And this is where a combination of technology and human empathy or human qualities becomes extremely important. This is an example of some uh, body uh, doing a remote exercise a clinic, um, uh, giving people in wheelchairs advice on how to maybe do rehabilitation or exercise. Now the, the other thing I want to mention is the Ageing Society Challenge. And as a 73 year old I'm very conscious of the fact that I am in this ageing society. Uh, and what we've seen is a combination of many, many things, uh, a lot of which are related to lifestyle behaviours and practices, but also to increase mobility of uh, a population, leading to quite a significant number of, of challenges uh, for ageing society, not just uh, illness, but also mental health problems from social isolation. Um, and this is going to create greater challenges that nursing profession has an enormous role to play. This is a picture of my mother uh, when she was in intensive care in Ketching General Hospital. She suffered from uh, dementia and she was really kind of representative of some of these challenges. We're living longer, we need more medical care, there's fewer working people to cover the costs. Caring for the elderly has, has shifted in my generation from family care to care homes. Unfortunately, elderly care is a, public, a poor relation of public health services and what coronavirus has done is exposed our vulnerability to unsustainable public health care services. So home and community care um, will use technologies to enable partnerships where nurses, I think, will play an enormously important role. But all of this is part of a transition from cure to prevention. I argue that we have not a national health service, we actually have a national sickness service which is focused on curing problems um, rather than preventing them. We need to make those changes. And nurses have quite a big role in, uh, to play in this um, uh, because they can act as coaches and mentors. Um, and so it, it actually helps people to better manage their own health by perhaps getting involved in um, being trained in, in lifestyle medicine practices because um, lifestyle related conditions are uh, one of the biggest causes of mortality today. Um, I just want to close off by mentioning a couple of things, digital medicine and digital therapeutics and th these are um, Things I think um, which nurses, uh, it's important for nurses to get uh, involved in understanding where we're going with these and, and these are based on first of all uh, technologies like you, the one that you see on the left which is a kind of a mock-up of what you might see from wearables in the future and these, uh, these are devices that can influence our behaviour um, and, uh, and lead to better personal health management. But these kind of technologies, virtual reality, AI and the rest of them, can also help to deliver therapies which are not dependent on, on drugs. So digital therapeutics, um, there's many, many developments in, in all kind of physical, mental health rehabilitation. Someone um, in the audience today is from a project called VR2Care which is a great example of the use of virtual reality, providing care for the elderly. And these kind of solutions must empower humanity and empathy. 
Uh, they provide solutions for physical and mental health, and in order to be effective, they must be plug and play. It's no good expecting, particularly elderly or ill people, uh, to be able to uh, tackle uh, technological challenges. And to be effective, they must combine realistic challenges with fun. This is all part of the serious gains philosophy. It's important also to connect with, uh, engage with the family and community and provide feedback and diagnostics for both motivation and health traffic. And the whole point of this is it gives users control over their own health. So in conclusion, uh, I, I want to finish off by suggesting that uh, COVID-19 has actually accelerated the use of the digital technologies in health services not only empowering but they're also disruptive uh, and that means that some people's traditional roles will be challenged by these technologies humanity and empathy must be paramount nurses roles will change and upgrade and vr and simulations as the people at bournemouth university know uh, are great tools to help training so finally digital therapeutics uh, will support rehabilitation stress management and uh, preventative um, health care uh, so if I just switch back to my studio um, and I'm just going to see whether uh, I've been joined by uh, any of audience. So it looks as if I'm uh, on my own. Um, um, so what I'm going to do is to I'm going to stop screen sharing in a second um, and I'm going to sit myself down at um, another seat so you can see me sat um, in comfort, um, uh, a comfortable armchair, ready to take any questions that you may have. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now, which will take me back to uh, Zoom, and and hopefully uh, people will have gained something from that. We're the you, only ones that have got our do, mics on. You can do thumbs up, guys, <laughs> or, up. or clapping hands. Thank you, Christina. And David, Dennis, thank you okay. so much. What a fascinating run through of how nurses' education may be transformed through some of these, these different disruptive technologies. Um, I've got at least five questions, but I think I ought to open it up to the floor first. Anthony, what have we got first? Well, we, we've got uh, quite a few questions. So um, David, uh, uh. several of them were popped up at different points um, in, in your in your talk. So I think I'll just kind of go through chronologically. Mm. Um, people are, you're welcome um, at this stage, if you want to put your video on, um, uh, you know, so that uh, for our Q&A session, you're welcome to. We are going to keep microphones off, however. And um, just a reminder, we are uh, uh, recording here. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, one of the uh, first uh, questions was a technology one from Carl, um, where he's uh, talking about um, uh, the, 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 the room the, that you used um, in your presentation, David. Um, it, he wants to know if that's a commercial product or, or is this something that you've developed yourself? Uh, I wish it was something I'd developed myself, but I, I don't have the competence to do that. No, it is a commercial product, um, and uh, it's, a, well, in, in my opinion, it's ex extremely uh, affordable. Um, I have uh, what's called a starter license, so um, it costs me £6 a month uh, to have access not, to the, not just to this TV studio, uh, but but also to a range of other rooms that be more suitable suitable for smaller meetings uh, like uh, seminar rooms or, or even you know more casual um, uh, meeting rooms. Okay, great. Um, uh, Debbie, you want to pop over with your next question, and then I and then I've got Absolutely. a few more after the, afterwards. Um, I was fascinated by the transitions slide that you put up. You know, with people across the ages. I just wondered, did you have any thoughts about the key kind of pivot points where nurses might might be starting to intervene differently moving forward? Um, well, I, I, I think the main point is that um, I think um, AI and VR will actually en enhance nurses' roles and, and give them an opportunity to take on higher level jobs. 
Uh, it's interesting to me, uh, one of the things that's very interesting to me about, about, about all of this is that AI is uh, described as the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and if you go back to the first industrial revolution, uh, we saw the emergence of people who were so anti the technology because it took away their jobs. Uh, people like weavers, uh, they started destroying the technologies that um, uh, were cause them to lose their, their job and, and, and make um, their, all the training and skills they build for a lifetime that worth nothing. Um, today, I think it's interesting that one of the challenges that nurses seem to be um, very vocal about, it's not just about the, the conditions and the wages of nurses, but it's also the pressure that they're under because they don't have access to these kinds of technologies. Um, and I think this, this transition um, is likely to take a, a little while because the NHS is particularly slow in moving on, on some of these things. But the number of it is, I think um, AI, AI in particular, um, will help to accelerate nurses' training. I think, as you've seen with a number of other professions, the amount of training that you will need to become a qualified nurse will actually reduce over time uh, because of not only the use of these technologies, uh, but also when they go into practice, they will have a set of tools which will help them to perform their, their work. Uh, so this has happened in other professions. Um, many other professions are already seeing this as you need less training. Surgery, for example, surgeons need less training today, particularly with uh, robotic surgery uh, than they have done in the past. I'm not sure whether that answers no. the question. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. Okay, what's our next one, Anthony? Well, um, I just want to say, um, Debbie, that um, uh, we've got a flurry of questions now that have come <laughs> in. And uh, thanks to everybody who, who are uh, submitting in the text chat. Um, and, and David, um, what we may have to do is, um, if we're running out of time, uh, um, uh, make note of, of some of the questions and then we can put them yeah. up in, in our... Yeah a blog and, and uh, follow up uh, afterwards. Yeah. Um, but um, Christina um, it has a non-technical question for you um, ab about um, uh, the organizations that, that are going to be uh, looking at adopting different AI technology. So what infrastructure changes are needed for this type of adoption? Well, um, I mentioned uh, these things are possible through a cocktail of enabling technologies. Um, and when it comes to infrastructure, and I'm thinking back to my, my time at the start of the Serious Games Institute, one of the things that was most important was to have the highest speed communications infrastructure and the best, best quality uh, visual, uh, visual display and audio. Uh, so I think uh, the, the infrastructure uh, particularly 5G and broadband, uh, cloud computing, uh, some near what 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 are called near field uh, communications, which are able to uh, track wearable technologies. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of uh, re reluctance within the medical profession to trust these consumer devices like Fitbit and so on, um, because uh, many of them or most of them. Um, are not medically validated and yet uh, in reality uh, they're actually probably more accurate than a lot of tools that uh, doctors and nurses use today. Um, I, I, know, I know this myself because I've been using these devices and seeing how they've matured over a period of time and one of, one of the barriers to the infrastructure part of, uh, of, of all of this is a reluctance of people who are developing consumer devices and including this uh, smartphones and mobile applications, they're reluctant to go for clinical validation uh, and have people, uh, both software and hardware classified as a medical device for fear of litigation. Uh, because if uh, the data is interpreted by somebody like me. If I look at my smartwatch, it tells me to go for a run, and I've actually got a heart condition. Um, you know, it, it, it opens up all kinds of, of uh, problems um, uh, to do with this. But 
I, I think uh, over a period of time, um, the the most critical thing is the the bandwidth, the five G, the broadband, uh, cloud computing, um, and AI, and um, AI particularly, um, and AI that is not Chat GPT. Uh, it is uh, using AI with, if you like, properly validated databases. Uh, and, and as an example of this, I've been talking to a company um, uh, about their use of artificial humans uh, linked to artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and if you can imagine the scenario is, and particularly the, it's targeting the pharmaceutical industry. So um, this, is, this is a, a solution that's been designed both for doctors and patients. So the idea is that you can connect to an artificial human who is almost indistinguishable from the real thing, and you can talk to them on your phone or on your computer with your voice, and you can ask them questions, and they will get the answers from clinically validated data. So this will be a service that's available 24 by 7. Um, and I say from a pharmaceutical industry point of view, um, it saves some of the problems um, that doctors might have. They don't want to see a pharmaceutical rep. They got, haven't got enough time to do with them. So they can access these kind of technologies and find the answers they need about the, uh, the drugs and, and the treatments. And patients can do the same. So, you know, uh, but these things will only be made possible if you've got the infrastructure, 5G, broadband, uh, uh, and AI that is clinically validated. Yeah, that's that's interesting, uh, David. Thank you for that. Um, and and uh, uh, Adrian has got a, another kind of non-technical question um, about the training. So you know, we're, we've got all this these tools, we've got all this software, um, but what about training the people? Well, um, uh, I I think. Yeah, training uh, does not always depend on technology, but um, uh, we, we have the tools, particularly with, with VR. And I, I mean, I know most people think when we talk about VR, we think about a virtual reality headset um, and uh, an environment. Uh, but there's a lot of VR solutions in the early days that you can access on your on your smartphone or on your on your computer. So. It's actually a virtual reality environment. Um, and I, I think um, training uh, is going to be much more personalized. Because the thing about um, AI and the, in, in education, uh, one of the big values of it is not only that it can respond and uh, uh, answer, answer your questions, but it can also detect and track your learning style and your competencies. Um, and as a result of that, it can adjust the learning program to your capabilities and to your needs. Um, uh, and, and so I think this is a way, uh, the way ahead is actually lead to 24 by seven access to personalized learning experiences, which are based on uh, a mixture of uh, the person's interests and their competencies. Right, we've got a can of worms now. We're going oh to dear. talk about yeah. ethics. We've had an amazing question through <laughs> from, from, Denise. De from Denise. So Anthony, what did Denise ask us? Well, yeah, yeah, um, we're, we're, you know, we're getting into quite a bit of, of a range of, of topics. And, and so, um, you know, the issues here now uh, that Denise is is concerned about um, is is around the ethics of using the AI um, for service users or staff. Um, you know, what what are your thoughts, David, about that? Well, AI does open up a can of worms, as you say. There there are a lot of ethical issues involved in this, um, and. Although in a hopefully light-hearted way, um, I showed an AI modified picture of, um, uh, of Debbie and, uh, uh, and Skip at Bournemouth University, um, I could also uh, have played you a video of Debbie singing Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. 
Um, and you, you, you're going to have to show it, aren't you? <laughs> no, no. Well, no. I, I, I'm, I'm reluctant. I can show it, but I, I'm reluctant to show it. Uh, but you know, th this is the point: is that if you if you can create um, an artificial person based on their photographs, is which what I do for for fun uh, uh, for people, um, and then I get them to sing Gangnam Style or Staying Alive or. Uh, James Brown singing, I, f I feel good. And to be honest with you, it, even though it is obviously not uh, completely lifelike, it is very, very good. Uh, and, and when you think that you can make anybody say anything or sing anything just by having access to a photograph, there are clearly some significant ethical issues yeah. involved with that which need to be addressed my own personal view is um and i wrote a book on this over a decade ago is i am very fearful i'm very fearful yeah. of the future uses of artificial intelligence because i think the human race is going to become far too dependent on these technologies um, and I, I, my, my book is called Gadgets to God. It's not a religious book, but it makes the point uh, that our relationship with technology is transformed from when, or most of my life growing up, certainly most of my life, human beings use technology as a gadget to empower them. You know, so we were in control of the technology and it needed human skills to be able to use the technology to get the best results. Today, we have already gone past the point where technology is actually using its knowledge and experience to influence us and to control us. And so we spend more time communing with our smartphones than, than we ever do in church or any other kind of religion. So if you, if you think about what people's, most people's view of uh, a God, it's about an all-seeing, all-knowing entity in the sky that knows everything we do, he knows the secrets of our heart, um, it understands us perfectly, um, and it can influence our lives, and we spend time talking to it. Well, that's exactly what we do. We do that with our smartphones and our social media and all these other things. So there are some real ethical issues that need to be addressed. I'm not the only one who thinks even Elon Musk you know, he is warning about, uh, and, and the guy who was developed AI for Google, he's recently retired, expressing uh, views and doubts about the, uh, the, the what's happening with, with AI. So I, the, my, the, my biggest fear is actually, I think we've gone past the, the tipping point. I don't think there's any way back from here. It's, it's, it's you cannot, un, it's just an example. Once the atomic bomb was invented, you cannot uninvent it. You're stuck with it and it's the same with the internet once the internet has been invented and once there's this demand from us as consumers to use it you cannot uninvent it uh, and, and it's the same with with AI and a lot of these other technologies they're there and how how it's going to be managed and controlled in the future you know I really I really don't know. I'm sorry to be pessimistic about this, but um, you know. well, that's a re that's a really, really, really good good set of thoughts. And just a little note for staff at BU: I've got David's most recent book in my office. If you'd like to borrow it, <laughs> um, right? Okay. We're moving more to, on to healthcare again now. Didn't we have yeah, something about yes. long-term health? Yes, exactly, Debbie. Um, mm. uh, uh, we've got a, a, a question. Um, from uh, Julie, first of all, um, uh, and I, I think this question can be it broadened into uh, all of the different professions in healthcare. But she's concerned: Will will AI um, replace radiologists? Um, well, I, I think if you look, what, what does a radiologist do? A radiologist uh, uses uh, devices, MRI scanners, and other, other devices uh, to create a, an image of the inside of the body uh, and that task will remain that won't go away you know we need that kind of technology to be able to do that but what will happen I think um, is that radiologists uh, will <laughs> it's um, difficult to express this really um, but 
radiologists won't need the same kind of skills and training to be able to use these devices. They will become, if you like, uh, equipment operators. They will still have to um, use their expertise, I think, to act as a backstop in case um, uh, to, to support AI. Um, but I think what will happen um, is that um, radiologists will be a job. It, the job will remain, but it will be perhaps um, be part of a wider range of skills. So you won't have specialist radiologists. You will have people who are multi-skilled, capable of doing radiology. So where these technologies are, are where the tasks are better done by AI and other technologies, from a health point of view, uh, you know, if, if I were going in for some treatment, I would rather have a diagnosis that's a good one, um, that's done by accurately by a machine that is better than the human being, than actually rely on the vagaries of, of a human being. It's the same with um, robotic surgery. To give you another example, I spoke to a guy who got prostate cancer a few years ago, um, and, and he had uh, robotic surgery in Australia. And the surgical outcomes of that were far better. Uh, it didn't have some of the undesirable side effects you can get from uh, uh, surgery on prostate uh, cancer because the surgery is more precise. But the, the, the surgeon uh, was a trained surgeon, but it didn't need to be a fully trained surgeon. It need to be, uh, didn't have, need to have the, the kind of manual dexterity skills that you'd expect from a surgeon. You need to have somebody who was good at operating the equipment and understood how to, to do that. I, I digressed, I think, there. No, 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 no. That's okay. That's, yeah. That has kicked off a whole flurry of, of discussions and chat that we'll, we'll summarise and sort of send round later. And um, we're mindful that colleagues are rushing off to teach at one, etc., etc. We'll make this the last question, but we will go through. And David has very kindly agreed that he'll answer any of the the, you know the other questions we'll do a little summary and things and send it round and also we will share the recording of course we will so the last question was yep yep this is uh from from johnny and um and uh, you know you're you're talking about like technical uh aspects uh david of of ai um but what about um in, in a in a say in a, in a situation where you're trying to manage long-term conditions and what you really need is to have someone, you know, who's coaching you. So uh, is AI going to be capable of doing something like that? Um, well, I think AI will be used in certain circumstances for certain types of uh, conditions where um, it's appropriate. Um, it could be used to supplement human skills. I, I'm thinking now, and I go back to VR2Care um, and one of my uh, partners in Italy is a company called Rehability. Um, and what they, they provide um, is technology uh, that's based around uh, games that help people uh, to rehabilitate in, in their own home. So essentially, what you see in your own home, you look at a television set um, um, and you can see uh, an avatar uh, which represents you and you copy the exercises of the avatar. And whilst you're doing those exercises, uh, data is captured about your freedom of mobility, your, uh, your, your capability of performing these exercises. Why are you improving? Are you not improving? Um, and all of this data goes back to a, a trained physiotherapist um, in a hospital um, uh, who can use that data to remotely manage that person. So it is not a technology replacing a person, it's technology enhancing the capabilities of a person and allow them to deliver remote care more effectively. David, thank you so much. Carl, one of our clinicians has had to go and deal with, <laughs> with, with some of his patients before they revolt. <laughs> but, <laughs> Well, I, I wouldn't like to. I wouldn't like to be responsible for revolting patients. <laughs> <It was> a <laughs> wonderful, insightful, um, just 
set of thoughts, insights and comments about the way in which nursing may be changed with artificial intelligence, virtual reality and all of the other disruptive technologies that you've so skillfully set out for us today. Um, colleagues, the recording will be available. We will do some blog posts, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I've tweeted the key slides. Um, if we can do virtual claps and waves, that would be very, very nice. Thank you all for coming. The next one is on the 12th of June at 12 o'clock. And David will be talking about the metaverse health and well-being. So we really look forward to that.